Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Fisher. I'm the Executive Director of Erie Arts and Culture. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for a Pro Network seminar presented by Tom Ferraro. Uh, Erie Arts and Culture believes in the uh, catalyst power of the arts and artists in our community. Uh, and we believe that artists can achieve great things when they're provided access with uh, professional development resources and opportunities, which is why we started the Pro Network. The Pro Network is funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts through their Artworks Grant Program. This evening, we're joined by Tom Ferraro. Tom is an artist, painter, teacher, and public art advocate. He is both a teaching artist and a board trustee of Erie Arts and Culture, and has been a rostered teaching artist with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts since 2011. Among his professional affiliations, Tom has been a member of the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh since 2004. Tom is also a member of the Northwestern Pennsylvania Artist Association and served as their co-director from 2008 through 2016. In 2012, he became the co-founder of the Looking Glass Art Project, a program designed to engage community uh, stakeholders in the development and production of public art. Tom has exhibited extensively through the region and his work can be found in local Erie galleries and several public, corporate, university, and private collections throughout the United States. Highlights of his exhibition record include several one and two person exhibitions, including his solo exhibition Safety Zone, currently on view at the Erie Art Museum. Tom actively exhibits in many uh, invitational and juried group exhibitions. He has exhibited at the Carnegie Museum of Art and the Erie Art Museum's annual spring show. Among other notable group shows, Tom has exhibited at the Hoyt Center for the Arts, the Butler Museum of American Art, Mercyhurst University, Three Rivers Arts Festival, in galleries in Pittsburgh, Miami, and New York. Tom has won numerous awards for his work in various jury competitions. In 2012, he received the inaugural Bruce Morton Wright Artist of the Year Award at the annual Fall for Arts and Culture Awards presented by Erie Arts and Culture. In 2016, Tom was honored at the Erie School District's annual Partnership for Public Education as PEPS's star for his contribution to arts education in the Erie School District. Tom, thanks for joining us this evening and uh, thanks for being a, a presenter. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for having me and thank you to everybody who's joined me tonight. Um, I appreciated the opportunity to do this presentation, especially since it's come you know, within a couple of days of the election, it's given me a chance to stay busy and not stay on my uh, phone and my computer looking at results. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do this uh, presentation. So I'm gonna jump uh, right to my PowerPoint. So give me a sec to share my screen and, um, and we'll get into the presentation. As we do that, I just want to say it's good to see your uh, your co-creator Ed Grout uh, joining us this evening. Ed, are you uh, are you in California now? Yep, oh, you're muted, Ed. Am I on now? Yes. yes, sir. Are you in California? No, I'm in Washington State. Okay. Well, we're glad to hear that uh, your your trip west uh, went well and that you've arrived at uh, the first destination. Yes. It was a challenge. Hi, Ed. If we know anything about hey, our trip to overcome challenges. Patrick, am I screen shared? Not yet. Oh, I'm not. Okay, well, let me go back. Hey, Dean. Hi, Ed. I am also glad you made it back. Uh -oh, what happened? All right, you are screen shared now, Tom. Uh, but you're sharing you're sharing your whole computer desktop as opposed to just the presentation. But I think we can work with it. So why don't we go ahead and go with that? Or what do we got now? Yep, we're going to our project. Is that good? Yep. Okay. So I'm thrilled to have Ed uh, joining us here because he is uh, the other half of the Looking Glass Art Project and. I didn't know if he'd be able to make it today because of his travels. So Ed, feel free to chime in whenever uh, you feel the need. I'll be, I'll be the disruptor. Thank you. Uh, 
So I wanted to just spend a second and talk about my interest, my personal interest in public art and sort of where the seeds were planted and uh, how long it really took to get to fruition. And it really, it really became um, uh, kind of a three-part thing that converged together to really uh, get me to uh, actually start thinking about doing this in my art practice. So my origins, all right, now my screen's not moving. Oh, oh there, there you go. go. Okay, so uh, my origins go back to New York. Uh, back in 1985, I was working uh, in Soho at a restaurant called the Green Street Cafe, and we had a huge mural in the restaurant that was done by a, uh, I believe she was a Dutch artist, Francois Schein. And while I was working at the restaurant, she did a large public art installation called the Floating Subway. And that's the image that you're looking at now. So it was an inlaid uh, piece with glass and um, glass and metal. And it represented the New York subway system kind of as a living body and uh, you know, a living, breathing kind of an organism. So uh, I just found it to be really fascinating. Uh, the fellow I worked with or worked for was a strong supporter of public art. He commissioned this piece and he went on to commission several public art projects throughout Soho in New York South Beach in Miami, uh, among other places. So that was kind of where my seed got planted. And then um, in 1982, I was also fascinated by the whole process that uh, selected the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and started to get uh, interested in the work of Maya Lin, who uh, a few years back, Ed and I went to Pittsburgh and watched, she had a large show at the Carnegie. and. Uh, saw how she worked and how, how she considered site and materials and, uh, and in this case, reflection uh, to really create a powerful statement. So untraditional to what we would typically see of a, uh, a war memorial. And then fast forward to about 2006, my oldest daughter started college in Philadelphia at Temple University. And I was exposed to the Philadelphia Mural Arts Program. So I, I was visiting Philadelphia uh, on several occasions and it, they had at the time about 3,500 murals in the city. And I just, I just really loved what they did in terms of just creative placemaking and creating an identity for different neighborhoods. Uh, so I, I was interested enough that I, you know, I went online, I looked at some of the things they did. I found out that one of the times that I was going to be visiting Philly, that uh, they were going to have a community workshop. So I went to that and I learned a little bit about techniques and materials. Uh, their program has been around since the 70s. It started as an anti-graffiti movement. And, um, and if you have an opportunity, go to the Philadelphia Mural Arts website and look at their mission and values and their vision. And uh, you will see that this is uh, just an incredible program. And I'm really happy to, to say that, you know, this, this kind of spearheaded me and I think as I've seen what's happened in Erie in the last seven, eight, nine years, uh, we've seen a lot of what I was seeing in Philadelphia starting to, starting to emerge here a little bit. So um, it's great to see how we're moving forward with some of this public artwork. The third piece that kind of led to the convergence was my uh, position as a school residency teaching artist. So it was through that program that I really started to see where community opportunity can come from and seeing how, what the impact was in a classroom uh, with students who 
maybe are underachievers in a more traditional learning path uh, really uh, come into their own at, and, and become interested in realizing that there are things that they could do to succeed. And I think that's something that art brings out, um, especially in our education system today that has, you know, typically the art programs. I mean, when I first started in art residencies, most of the schools were doing art on a cart where a teacher was working and an art teacher was working in three or four different schools and, you know, bringing materials in and out and having about a half hour to work with kids. So. I found that the residency program that we did was really strengthen and reinforce um, learning goals. And that convergence of interest in public art, interest in placemaking, interest in what I thought was an opportunity for some lifelong learning. There we are, Ed. So I ran into this guy. Uh, taking a class as a teaching artist. And we started having conversations about what lifelong learning might look like and specifically what it looks like for seniors. And uh, at the time, Ed's mom was uh, in a nursing home and he was, you know, not that enthusiastic about some of the opportunities that she was giving to just stay vibrant and stay creative and keep thinking. And, and uh, uh, so we thought that we'd put up, put together a program that would address what we thought was a shortcoming in senior living centers. So that was kind of our starting point. It was just an idea and we really felt that there was a need. And I don't know, Ed, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, what we, what we were uh, confronted with was uh, bingo, uh, cards, things like that, that were there to entertain the seniors. And we thought we could go a lot further than that and actually find out something about their lives uh, and make it a little more vibrant than just game playing, maybe actually create things that they could uh, put in their uh, senior centers. Great, thank you. Um, so we put together a flow chart and you don't have the full flow chart here. I just have a, just a one pager, uh, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of where our thoughts were. So, you know, we sort of color coded it. We knew we had to do, you know, put some marketing materials together to get people interested in, in what our idea was. And we were really just looking for one opportunity to create a project. So, um, so we came up with this flow chart and it, it sort of highlighted what our process was gonna be. It talked about who the people would be that would be involved, uh, what our workshops might look like in terms of how long they would be, how long they would last, uh, what kind of activities we would have in these workshops, uh, who would participate in these workshops, what that participation, what value that partition, participation would have, and then the outcomes. And the outcomes were broken down into short, medium, and long-term outcomes. And our, our presentation was really about the whole thing. We had a real feel for, we really felt that public art uh, was the important end product, but we also felt that process was just as important. And this is something that really came uh, a lot out of Ed um, when he was in grad school. His work was really based on community input and community participation and uh, that wasn't really something that was taught back in art school back in the day. Uh, we were really taught to work in our silos and find our, just kind of find our signature and, you know, create our own, uh, kind of our own path. Yep. And this was something that was very different than that. 
I might add something here, Tom. <clears throat> you referred to the, um, you know, <clears throat> the school residency program. It was sort of like that when I first started too, that the students actually watch the artist uh, make things, do their craft. Uh, they didn't have a whole lot of hands-on. It was more like, let's watch the artist do his thing. And uh, I found that uh, that didn't really make it. I mean, you had to have, especially uh, when we started introducing the curriculum into the uh, art process. Uh, then we got a lot of more hands-on and started creating uh, pieces that would go into the school rather than just them observing how the artist works. So yeah. it's kind of the same thing that we wanted to, to, um, to bring to the seniors. Yeah, it really, it really captured us to, to open our eyes to what the opportunities might be. So, so we went around to um, several uh, senior living centers around town and presented our great idea and, <laughs> found, and found out that, uh, you know, we got a lot of head nods. Yeah, this is great. But whenever we got to how we're going to fund this, um, they never got off the ground. So we were, as we were looking around, uh, we had the opportunity, we connected with LifeWorks Erie, which at the time was on 4th and Peach. And while we couldn't, um, while we couldn't convince them to pay us to do a project at the time, <laughs> they did, they did, uh, they did uh, say they would pay for some materials. So uh, we had a little material budget and then everything else was kind of on us. But what we wanted to do was really to uh, do the project, document it, and be able to use it for uh, a future time. So the piece that you're looking at on your screen is the first piece that we did, uh, titled Life. It was done with about 15 or 16 participants. Uh, this is a senior community center. So these are folks that are pretty, um, uh, they're, you know, they're pretty vital. And they go to LifeWorks to participate in other programs. They have exercise programs and all different things. And it was, you know, it's just a, it was a great opportunity with a, with a really great group to do our first project. So our first project, we decided that we would, um, we would talk to them about their social networks and communication technology, because we felt there was a disconnect between seniors and you know, to, to them, we always heard, well, that, that's for the younger generation. And our conversation was, no, it's not just for the younger generation, but it's also for, uh, actually, your generation started this thing uh, way back. And we went back to the time of, uh, and you'll see on our L embedded uh, dots and dashes. So we started with Morse code. And then on the right side of, uh, then there's some symbols of life on there. There's uh, postage stamps, which was a form of communication. Uh, we used to write letters back at one time and actually put them in the mail. We had our participants brought us in some old postage stamps, some really cool things for, out of their stamp collection to put on the piece. Uh, when we got to the, the I, the I, uh, it rep represents a test pattern, and we realize that everyone in our group understood what a test pattern was. But one day we had a couple of the grandchildren come in. They had no clue what a test pattern was. They never saw one before. They've never seen TV being off air. So um, within that that piece in that I, there's uh, a series of zeros and ones. So we're kind of talking about the advent of the computer age. And on the upper piece, we have, a, uh, again, it's kind of hard to see in the slide, but there's a fused glass piece that's inside of a 10 inch, I believe it's a 10 inch um, uh, vinyl disc. 
uh, record, which I never knew existed. And then um, we moved to the F and in the F we had, we have uh, self portraits that our participants did that they painted and we asked them to paint an image of themselves from the 1970s. So we wanted to try to capture this time at the advent of the computer age. And then the E um, kind of represented what's to come in the future, whether it be MP5 or whatever that next wave in the internet uh, would be in computer technology. And then to sort of round off the piece, you'll see QR codes that are scattered around the piece. And within those QR codes, if you scan a QR code with, uh, with a smartphone or an iPad and you have the app, uh, it will access the, uh, a video of an interview with all of our participants. So part of our goal was to create this legacy for seniors. And we felt that for a relative to be able to walk in and actually um, trigger an interview with their, um, with their grandparents or great grandparents, something that is sort of immortalized and hear what they had to say about, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, what does life mean? Um, and hear about some of their values and some of the things. We had a whole series of questions that we asked them. And I'll talk to you in a minute about uh, questions. So um, LifeWorks really loved the, the project and they went on to, uh, they went on to give us another project to do. So we thought, well, since they're called LifeWorks and we just did life, we're gonna do works. So we had another group and a lot of the same people, but also probably half the same and half new people. And we explored, and, 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 I, and I might add that most of the participants in this project were female, all but one, I believe. And we talked about the idea of work. And uh, most of these women had careers. And one of them had, had a story. She was the first jitney driver for General Electric. Uh, you'll see our pieces actually, we had them either make or bring in small items that uh, we would sort of embed almost like a, a fossil uh, into, we used some plaster of Paris and then we put some paint uh, and we, um, we embedded tools of their trade. So you'll see scissors and stethoscopes and uh, rolling pins. There's ballet slippers in there. Uh, there there's, there's all kinds of things that uh, I think even there's even a little toy truck in there for one of, uh, one of our participants who was a, a fireman, the one male. So, uh, and then the, the blue background is sort of that river of life that creates uh, a lot of turns and twists and, you know, pivots. And interesting enough, those, you know, the, those stories that we heard, and one thing we started to realize when we started working with this group were, was when you're working with seniors and you're starting to get their stories, you're not getting stories about, you know, what they dream of being and what they hope to do. And we've done those projects with younger folks, but these people were like, this is what, this may be what I thought life was gonna be flowing along in that blue. And then all of a sudden you hit a jagged edge and your life pivots and it forces you to do something that maybe is out of your comfort zone and that you need to do. And that's, that's life. And that's what we find out as we get older. So I'm gonna play a short video. Um, Ed and I made this video sort of as a opportunity to, now that we had a couple projects under our belt, LifeWorks asked us to do a presentation in Chicago at the Midwest Lifelong Learning Conference. So we had to submit a proposal. We were accepted. 
And this video is a part of what we presented. And this, uh, this will show some of the work that went into those two projects that I just showed you. Assuming it plays. There we go. We all hear this all right? Yeah, you got it. It was about four minutes. Ed Grout and Tom Ferraro, both well-respected visual artists with over 50 years of combined experience, are leading art enthusiasts and beginners on an extraordinary adventure. Both Grout and Ferraro have seen the disconnect between the elderly in our community and the world around them. It seems uh, that they're marginalized, they're, they're put aside when they get to a certain age. If they're not productive in the workforce, they're kind of put out to pasture and actually preyed upon by uh, our system just to take their money until they die to take care of them. The artists discovered seniors were missing a key part of their vitality and interactiveness in our culture through the programs they were given at senior homes and centers. We saw the activities that the seniors are given and, and you know, they're, they're, they're really exercises uh, that, you know, things like just to occupy their time. There are things like bingo and puzzles and, you know, they might do a, a, a little arts and crafts project. But we wanted to give them something richer, something deeper, something that they could really think back on their lives and reflect on their own legacies and see how different components of their lives shaped who they are. It's a much deeper process than simply giving them a piece of paper and uh, some colored pencils and say draw. Through the Looking Glass helps to create opportunities for seniors to reflect on the people, places, events, and technology in their lives that shape the fabric of their social network. The workshops promote healthy behavior and help seniors achieve a sense of control and to feel empowered through visual creativity and storytelling. We were overwhelmed by how the, the, the people really got involved in it, the, the participants really got involved in it, and how it changed their life. I mean, like they were very vital, they were looking forward to our sessions, and surprised and amazed at the outcome of the piece. I get approached by some of the participants, and, and many of them have said this is not at all what I expected, which I love to hear. Uh, because I know what they expected. They expected another arts and crafts project. And, they, and, and again, they're, most of them have some experience in art and they're, they're thinking that because they're working with two visual artists that are active uh, exhibiting in a community and so on, that they're gonna learn a little more about their art. But what we want them to learn is a little more about themselves. And, and I have had them say to me, uh, I didn't expect this, what you are giving me is the opportunity to think again. And that's music to my ears. I hadn't touched a paintbrush in 40 years, and now I'm back to painting, and I painted as a young child. And I just think it helps fulfill something. People need to be able to express themselves, whether they never have or they haven't. It makes them think a little bit, gets maybe their hands that they haven't worked in a long time working. And no, they don't have to be a Picasso. They can just have fun. When public art is out there uh, for everybody to see, uh, you can't help but notice it. And, and you can't help at some point to get engaged with it. We want people to be able to interact with it. And again, that's something that maybe can't be done in a gallery or a museum. We see the amazing results of what we do with, uh, with seniors. But we'd like to take it to uh, you know consensus building and maybe you have a corporate team that you want to get online and you want to get them involved in, in a project. This is a good way to do that, to get them working together. Yeah, we would really love to, to you know, roll this project out nationally and uh, either work hands-on with uh, seniors throughout the country or train other artists to uh, to do a similar project uh, within their locales. And again, we think that, you know, as the 
aging population grows, which we know it's going to, that these are things that could really add to quality of life. So that was our first uh, crack at some kind of promotional material and to really get a chance to tell our story. And, you know, looking back, because that, that was produced uh, probably in 2013, and uh, we have expanded and we did, uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't quite moved out of Erie, but we've expanded in terms of our community groups and the, and the people that that we work with. And, you know, one of the reasons that we haven't moved out of Erie is because we've been busy here in Erie and uh, just haven't had an opportunity. Now, perhaps with that on the West Coast, we'll get some stuff going and somewhere in between. I wanted to talk for a second about this slide here because one of the things I wanna talk about, especially to if there's artists uh, looking, at, looking at this presentation, about what it takes to do a community-based public art project. So the first thing you need is a community. And uh, these are kind of our three pillars here that we talk about. Uh, community can be defined in a lot of different ways. So when we're in a school and we're in a classroom, we're in a community. And we're in kind of a, a closed-end community where we have a population that we know we're going to have to work with every time we go in to, to do a workshop or a class. Um, so that kind of a community works great for the program that we have developed. Um, we have learned to adapt, however, because we've realized that not every community looks the same. Uh, there are many communities that would like to give input, but they don't want to sit through a six week session. Uh, they may want to come for one or two sessions. Uh, they may, um, I'm going to be showing a project that we did with a lot of our new American population. And we realized that, you know, they had a little different uh, agenda in terms of their time commitments and so on. And we've had to learn to adapt as we've moved. And now, quite honestly, we kind of have fun uh, adapting. We've always kept our program very open-ended. One of the things that um, is on our workflow uh, chart is that uh, it, it says to be most effective, projects must be open-ended, leaving the content and the focus to be determined by the participants. So we really like to hear from community. We walk in with a blank sheet of paper. They may have a big idea. We're, our job is to drive imagery to that idea. They may not have a big idea. Then our job is to first establish the big idea and then drive the imagery for the big idea. The, the second pillar that we have is an installation site. It sure is better when you know where you're gonna be installing before you start the project. Uh, it hasn't always happened that way. Um, a few of our projects we've done, we've actually done the work and then looked for a site to install. Uh, and there's lots of things to consider when, it's, when you're looking at site installation, depending on what materials you're using, visibility, what direction the sun's shining, um, all kinds of things for site installation. And then there's always budget. So one of the things that I've always, uh, when I started to get deeply involved in uh, exhibiting and teaching and looking glass projects is, uh, I feel as though not only have I been an advocate for public art over these past 10 years, but I've also been an advocate for uh, for artists to be paid um, what I feel is a, is a fair and equitable uh, wage. And that's always been a little contentious because a lot of folks approach you and just want you to do it. 
Um, and, you know, really either very little compensation or no compensation. So we've sort of, you know, we've looked at best practices. We have kind of a chart that we work from that uh, we can price jobs depending on size and complexity. So th these three pillars are important. Uh, I don't think any project that Looking Glass can do could be done without the three. Ed, you got anything to add to that? Um, well, uh, no, actually, you know. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Okay, so our next project was, uh, and I'm showing you kind of in detail some of our early projects because not everybody's that familiar with how we kind of got started. Uh, but this one was really an incredible project that I think Ed and I, uh, I probably learned more in this project about humanity and people than I have in any circumstance that I've been in my life. So um, the Rouse home is in Youngsville, Pennsylvania, and they have three facilities. Uh, two are in Youngsville, they're on a campus. Uh, that used to be a, an estate uh, by a fella with the last name of Rouse, who was actually one of the early pioneers uh, in uh, the oil discovery. And um, he created this campus uh, originally for, um, I believe for, for uh, women who were unmarried and, and had children. And then it sort of has evolved over time into a senior living complex and there's three, and there's three um, parts of their complex. Uh, one is the Rouse home, which uh, houses uh, mostly folks that have either severe dementia, Alzheimer's, or a severe physical um, uh, handicap, uh, wheelchair bound, uh, not, not, very, not many motor skills, uh, some were, you know, did not have any communication skills. They, they weren't able to speak. Maybe they were stroke victims. Um, the other group, the second group that we actually would drive into Warren and meet with them, they were, there, there was a, um, a home called Bridges and it was an adult daycare. So what we found in Bridges were folks that were, uh, were brought during the day to be in, in this uh, in this community, and uh, they ranged uh, age-wise from very young uh, people, probably in their twenties, who had uh, severe physical disabilities, uh, to again seniors that had dementia or Alzheimer's. So it was a real diverse group. And then the third group we met with, which was back on the Rouse uh, campus, was a, a little more hands-on uh, group that was, it was more a, a, a senior living that was uh, where they can do most of uh, their daily activities on their own. So a little more independent facility. So we worked with all three populations. These are the two pieces we ended up doing with them. But the story really isn't in the two pieces. Uh, the story's in the population we worked with. I'm gonna jump back to this slide in a second. Um, this, is a, this is a little snapshot of some of the people that we worked with. And, uh, and, for, and as we move through the project, we realize that for some groups, like the woman that Ed's working with, she's giving him instructions uh, on how to cut paper, how to make a collage, what pieces she wants cut out, where she wants them to be um, glued down. Um, we try, one of the things again that we have in our workflow chart is that we want to work to people's abilities, not their disabilities. So we try to push them to do as much as they could do on their own and when they sort of hit that wall where they couldn't do any more, we jump in and we would help them complete what it is that they were starting. Uh, we did interviews with them. 
Uh, our, inter our interviews were just breathtaking, what you heard from some of these folks. Uh, I don't have the clips on this, it just I have literally hours of interviews with these folks. Uh, but we had one woman who was nonverbal, or we thought she was. Uh, she, for six weeks, she sort of, uh, she was the stroke victim and she was a little younger. And I actually did an interview with her and started to try to have a conversation with her and found out that through one of the aides that she was a, she was a communications professor at Temple. And I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that my daughter went there. So I started talking to her about Temple. And I asked her if she felt that uh, she made the world a better place through her teaching and she lifted her head up and she looked at me right in the eyes and she said, I certainly hope so. It's the first thing, first time I, that I heard her speak and first time that uh, the, the marketing director who was videoing it had heard her speak. We were stunned, but we really feel that, you know, the art had a huge impact on this population. So I'm gonna backtrack a second and I'm gonna go back to this guy, Paul Theck. Um, I don't know if I have any art teachers in, on my, in this program here, but uh, I, I found, I, I stumbled into Paul Theck, uh, this teaching notes, fourth dimension design um, many years ago, probably about the time, about the time I was starting to do some uh, teaching, uh, some, uh, in residencies and so on. And Thex has the, had, came up with this idea of teaching notes and I just love them. And we use these a lot for some of, um, some of the questions that we would use for interviews. Now, some of them, and what I loved about them is some of them are very direct to what you're trying to get at in terms of the art. And other stuff is just so random, it sort of throws you off a little bit when you're answering questions. So if I said, what is your favorite color? You're gonna give me, you know, blue, red, whatever. Uh, but if I say, do you take baths or showers? Do you use perfum perfume or deodorants? Uh, what style or look do you prefer? You might like really start to think, what's, what, what are they trying to get at here? But what happens is as we go through the workshops and we start, and we continually sort of pry a little bit into their questions, we see barriers start to break down. And we see people that start to maybe um, share things that they normally wouldn't share. And that's one of the problems that I have when we look at some community, um, when, we talk, when we talk about doing public art and engage the community and the community may have you know, one or two uh, sessions where you'll meet, I don't know, wherever, in a coffee shop or in an auditorium and you'll, you know, you'll sort of hear what people want to say specifically about that project, but you, what you don't really hear is where they're coming from. And that's what this document does. Uh, this is about four pages worth of questions. We'll pick and choose a few here and there, depending on the group that we're working with. So I just wanted to bring that up as a resource uh, because I think that they're, they're really great. Some questions get real personal. And, you know, we just avoid some of those, um, especially if we're in a school situation. So um, the next project that we, that we got was with, Hands, Housing and Neighborhood Development Service. And it was on the Villa Apartments uh, on 8th and Liberty. And when we had a conversation with the folks from Hands about what they wanted, uh, they had basically two sets of residents in this complex. They had a senior living area and they have a um, uh, more of a family living area. We also had a building that had an enormous amount of history, um, especially in that neighborhood. It was the original mother house for the Sisters of St. Joseph's. So they lived there, they taught there, it was a school, it was a, it was a elementary school, it was a high school, it was a, a college. Um, 
So the building has had multiple uses. And when we worked with this population, one of Han's goals was to sort of get these two populations together a little more. So we spent a lot of time with community there. We spent a lot of time talking to them about um, their lives and what um, different aspects of their lives. We talked to them about the building because this was their home. We asked them what it was like. Does it feel like, I think one of our questions was, uh, is, is, is your home your nest? Is it, your, is it just a place to stay? Is it you know, a place of comfort? And you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, that sister Michelle there, she sort of was an original uh, from the old Sisters of St. Joseph's. Uh, she's also uh, was, I don't know if she still is a professor again in university. And, um, and this reel has several interviews with her and several other uh, residents of, of that complex. So as the piece, and you could see in the upper right hand slide, we encourage as much as we can, we encourage participants to actually get their hand and do the painting. Uh, I did want to touch for a second on the role of a professional artist in these community projects. If you're doing a project that is something that is going to be in the community for a long period of time, um, you want to present it in the best possible way you can. And aside from leading the workshops, teaching people a few skills about drawing you in painting or sculpting, or in this case, we had some mosaic in this particular piece. Um, we also need to take the responsibility as artists to make sure it's it, the final product is, um, is presented properly. So um, I think that's one of the things that, that Ed and I really leaned on because of our art education. And you know we know the principles of art, we know it's gonna make uh, a strong piece and we try to teach our participants some of a little bit of that knowledge. In this particular project, we actually had a couple of really good artists that did a lot of the painting uh, that was in the, in the project itself. Everybody participated in the mosaic piece and Ed sort of guided us through that portion of, of the piece. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep moving here. I'm not going to play that, but there is a video there as well. We also did a piece at the uh, St. Joe's apartment building, uh, also a hands property. And they liked what we did with the first project. And they asked us if we would do something at their St. Joe's apartment on six in Maryland. So again, we were working with a with a closed community. We went once a week, we had pretty much the same people. A few people came in and out, but for the most part, we had the same people. And they really ran with this. They, they had a little, um, a little community uh, workroom that they, you'll see the bottom of this is mosaic. The top is actually fabric, painted fabric that are cutouts of birds. Um, we, our big idea was sort of, about the seasons of our lives and their lives and how it's sort of related to the season of the life of the building. The building originally was an orphanage. And so our tree on the left is kind of the spring tree and it's kind of the youth tree. And then in the center for a small time, it was uh, a school with the Erie School District. So the center is more the mature tree. And then the right is sort of the, uh, the, the, the mature tree, the, uh, the senior tree, if I should say. And they're all sort of rooted, their roots kind of run together through the mosaic. References to our seasons, reference to the lake. And again, these folks really did this piece almost single-handedly. I mean, Ed, gave, Ed and I gave them guidance, but they really did an amazing job with this. This piece also has, if you go to the lobby, there's also QR codes associated with both this and 
uh, the previous piece that I showed you that has a series of interviews with the participants uh, on, on all these projects. So then we kind of got out of our senior mode. We had the opportunity uh, to do a project. Um, we, we got a call from Sue Moyer, who was a neighborhood uh, project coordinator for Snoops, which was an east side neighborhood net network. Um, I'm actually sitting in the Snoops neighborhood as I speak here. And they wanted to do a project because this neighborhood is being populated by a lot of new Americans. So they wanted to show some kind of a welcoming piece for this project. So the piece that you're seeing here in this slide is the Polish flag uh, with um, children dressed in traditional garb and um, holding hands dancing. Now this wasn't our original design. So I'm gonna show you, I wanna show you on this slide here, on the lower right corner, you could see the image with the, uh, to the left of the street sign, the 13 feet, zero inches, you see a, a railroad bridge. So originally our design was to be on that bridge. That's what the neighborhood group wanted us to do. So we did a design, we did workshops with the neighborhood group. We did a design for the bridge only to find out that the bridge was owned by CSX. We needed to get approval from CSX. We sent a letter out to them. Uh, this was a case of, um, we had the population, we had the budget, and we thought we had the site and we didn't have the site. So the site fell through because they wanted uh, sort of um, insurance and perpetuity and for what reason we don't know. But um, we spoke to the neighborhood group and we said, hey, how about if we break up this idea into different sections and let's honor several of the nationalities that are moving into this area um, individually. And our initial design showed all these folks kind of dancing, uh, moving into a sort of a central area. So we kind of broke it up. And we had, um, so we did four different pieces that are scattered throughout the neighborhood. In reality, I think it's a, I think it was a better project uh, as it, as it moves. Much, yeah, much stronger piece now. Yeah. And, and, um, and, I, and, and one of the really neat things about this project is we had different, a lot of different people that actually helped us produce it. We had young kids, if you'll see on the left there, the kids painting the one mural. Uh, they were from a program um, that uh, they got in a little trouble. They had to do some community service. They're too young to you know, be handling like power tools and climbing ladders and that kind of thing. So they came to our studio once a week and they painted. Um, we also had uh, property owners who painted who helped us paint. And I wanted to show you on the lower right hand corner, that was the building that is the same image that's at the top that we did the mural. And when we decided to use that building, we asked the neighborhood group if they could maybe clear some of the, uh, some of the vines that were over the face of it. And then we would paint the rest of it. They ended up, we went, we went to the site one day and they had a new roof on the building. They had painted the entire building. And I'm gonna go on from there with the next slide. So here's the tattoo shop on 6th and Wayne, I'm sorry, on 12th and Wayne, uh, the bottom uh, piece. And that one was done uh, with the Bhutanese population, for, with the Bhutanese flag. The owner of the tattoo shop is on the left in our studio painting. She also painted their entire building. Um, they did some sidewalk work. They planted a couple trees. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with our project, but there was a kind of a nuisance bar across the street that closed. That's now Sham's Market, a, a wonderful Syrian market in the neighborhood. So you could see how the public art has moved 
um, moves the community. The, the image on the, uh, the upper image um, with the, the uh, Nepalese flag and the dancers there is on the, um, the secondhand store on 13th and Parade. This is on the 13th Street side. And they too painted all the trim around the building. Uh, so everybody sort of rises to the occasion when they know that they're going to have an installation in their community, which is wonderful. Now I'm going to spend a few minutes on art and industry. I'm going to move through this a little quicker because I see we're moving along here time-wise. Um, art and industry was probably one of our bigger projects. It was about a year and a half project. We had... Um, uh, about, we probably, I think we once counted, we had a, somewhere between 75 and 100 people that actually touched this project. There were three parts to it. We did a mural. Uh, you can see in the lower right, the site for the mural. It's the Erie Place House's uh, scenery shop and rehearsal space. You could see the mural on the left. That's nearly complete installation. And in the upper right, you could see us working with students at Erie County Technical School. This was the art and business class that helped us design and paint this mural. We also had other artists come in and help us with this particular piece. We had Ron Bayusic come in and take the lead on putting the horse together. And I thought you'd love to see the image on the upper right hand corner. That was the origins of our horse. Um, Ron was uh, great working with the students, helping putting the, the metal together. Um, but we also needed somebody who knew the anatomy of a horse. So we brought in Kathy Umloff, another residency teaching artist uh, who does fantastic uh, sculpture pieces of uh, all types of things, but a lot of animal uh, imagery in her work. We did internships. Uh, we set up an internship with Gene Davis Supply and the two boys on the left actually went to work at Gene Davis Supply uh, during this time period. Instead of coming to school, they worked and they fabricated the ribs for the globe uh, at Gene Davis. And in the lower right, you could see Ron uh, ducking to help in a student weld. And then the upper right, is the ceremony where we had our ribbon cutting when we installed the horse and globe. So the third piece that we had to do here, and there's the horse and globe. The third piece that we had to do was the wall, this wall on 12th and Green Garden. So we started by having the students paint the wall. By this time, we were out of time, we were out of budget. We had, we had a ton of materials that we had gathered. We had been to 12 different manufacturers in town. And all these pieces that you see in the upper right hand corner of this slide and the lower right hand corner are pieces that we took out of their shops, out of their recycling bins. Um, just, they were so generous and so happy to help. The guy on the left was our hero for that piece, um, Kevin O'Connell. And he, we asked him if they had any, he's with McGinnis, uh, rolled rings and actually he's retired now, but at the time he was, and we asked if they had like a ring that they might be a defect that they can't use. Um, he offered us, actually, I think we did six rings. Um, so he offered us, he sort of gave us just- I thought it was 11. Tell me what you need and he did it. I thought it was 11. Oh, I think it is 11, Ed. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just it was just great to see how community came together in this particular project. So here's another short video I'm going to play uh, that incorporates a lot of the art and industry, and it's another promo video for our Looking Glass project. is, is uh, making choices, solving problems, making decisions. And we found that uh, when you get um, 
a community of people together that maybe have never even sat down together and talked, but actually are working to solve problems within um, even just making a mural or uh, making a sculpture, that something happens. Uh, there's a communication that, that might not occur. There's an understanding that might not occur. There's a, there's a, a, a veil that's lifted. Uh, a lot of this fear and anxiety is uh, caused by um, ignorance and uh, not knowing uh, what the other person's life is about or, or what their culture is about. So we find that these projects, actually when people interact from other cultures, they f learn things about the other people that they might not know. And they find that, oh, that person is similar to what I go through daily, or that person is uh, not what I thought they were at all. They're, they're actually human beings living on this planet just like us. One of our professional teaching artists was in residence at a high school and at the culminating event when the mural was unveiled on the high school wall, the young lady and her mom were admiring it and they came up to me and we were talking and she said, I said, well, how did you enjoy the pro and project? What did you like best? What did you, what did you learn? And she said, um, this, this project saved my life. And at first, I was like, what? And she's like, you know, working with this artist, I found myself and it saved my life. I just want to say that, uh, again, being a businessman in Erie, I get a lot of calls for donations, monetary donations, whether it be United Way across the board. American Cancer Society, Erie Foundation. But I feel that if, if I do something like this art piece and I can see it, feel it, and touch it, it gives me a, um, a lot more satisfaction than handing somebody a check. And, and it's something that my kids can be proud of because their dad did this and something that the uh, community can fall in love with and enjoy for, for a lifetime. So when I can donate my time and, and effort and see something like this and know, I, I think it's a lot more special than, than uh, purely a monetary donation to a local organization. I think in the beginning it was a challenge to get some of those manufacturers on board, but as soon as that first artwork was unveiled, um, I'm quite certain that Tom and Ed began to receive phone calls and emails from the manufacturers that they had spoken to early on in the project because some of them had held back and when they saw the first artwork unveiled, then they realized how great this project was going to be, how uh, impactful I think the project was going to be for this community. And so uh, now I don't think that they're going to have any problem getting manufacturers on board uh, for whatever future projects they may have in the pipeline. Okay, to this point, we have probably eight to ten projects as a, as a team uh, under, the, under the, the umbrella of the Looking Glass Art Project. We've worked with um, students from Erie County Technical School. Uh, we've worked, uh, again, with senior centers, uh, with senior homes. We've worked with uh, communities that, um, uh, such as the Rouse organization, where there's multiple uh, populations from uh, skilled care facilities to adult daycare uh, to independent living facilities. Uh, we've worked intergenerational with neighborhood groups, neighborhood watch groups. 
we've we've done most of the work that we do uh, really is work with uh, populations that maybe don't have a voice and or feel uh, marginalized and, and uh, these are the these are the folks that we want to work with we want their stories told and there's no better way to do it than through public art because it really has the ability uh, to capture uh, both an individual story and a broader, more collaborative uh, group of people. So I'm going to just take you through one more um, project and then uh, just show you a bunch of some of the newer stuff just real quick and then I'll open for any questions. Um, this project was another really interesting one. This one started with a, a conversation to do a um, to do a, a storefront window display for our new American population. Um, it was through the Erie Downtown Partnership, um, a part of uh, a grant through Erie Arts and Culture, and um, and when Ed and I spoke to uh, Emily Fetchko and, and uh, John Buchna from the Erie Downtown Partnership, we started to talk to them about doing something maybe a little larger. So uh, we, um, we ended up getting going, so we, had, so we had a budget, we didn't have a site nor did we have community. So uh, we went to the International Institute of Erie to find community and we did our workshops with them. And we, uh, we spent our six weeks, and this was where we really saw what it was like to have a community that wasn't kind of like a captive audience, because we had a certain time each week that we would meet. And um, the first day we met, we had kind of what we thought we would get. We had a good mix of, of uh, different uh, people from different countries. Uh, we had a real language barrier uh, that was a little difficult to, to work through, but you know, we figured it out. Um, second week we went, we had a whole new group at all different people. Uh, third week we went because it was, I believe it was over like a, a, one of our holidays. We had all school children and none of the adults were there. Next time we went, we had one woman there who was a Somalian refugee. And fortunately, Emily uh, from Mary Downtown Partnership had gone with us. And we were able to sit and have an incredible conversation with this woman. And I think she felt comfortable because of Emily's presence there. And um, she told, I mean, she just, she just shared her story, which uh, is it's, it was heart wrenching to hear what her story was. She had been in a refugee camp since she was three. She was about 28 and had just come to Erie. Mm -hmm. So as we worked through, um, as we worked through the International Institute, we had some material, but we didn't feel we had enough. So we went through the summer trying to find out, uh, where we would move from there. And we ended up uh, going into Erie High School, which was their first year. They had about 240 English as second language kids. And we were able to do a residency with those kids. We went through a lot of different subjects. These students, none, none of them knew each other. We found that they were kind of uh, with each other, uh, with their own groups based on their nationality. We tried to intermingle them a little bit, get them to know some other cultures, find some commonality between each other, which we did. And we, we just were so excited for this project. We found a lot of them. We did a ton of sketches, a lot of drawing. And what started to emerge were these beautiful patterns. And we decided that we would make our piece based on fabric, and patterns that they might find in their native country. So sort of a collage of patterns. We also found that, you know, for our central figure, we wanted this kind of strong presence. 
And um, we, in the meantime, had found a site for the old Palace Hardware Building. Uh, it was owned by Altar Realty. Uh, they were kind enough to say, here's your wall, do what you want with it. You can see part of our process in this slide. Once we have our image together, we project the image. The students on the left are, are just kind of, um, uh, they're, they're tracing out the lines. On the right, you see them all painting the lines. They just rotated throughout the day in school uh, coming in to paint. So it was a great residency. Uh, the end product, we had asked the questions, I am, I will be, uh, I am, Erie is, and I will be. So uh, we got all kinds of answers. Uh, I will be helpful, I will be a protector, I will be creative, I will be funny, I, I am courageous, I am intelligent, on and on and on. This is where we found commonality. Um, we asked about Erie, they found it to be a safe environment, uh, historical, cold to a lot of them. And then uh, we asked what they wanna be and we got teacher, doctor, nurse, all the things that you would expect from uh, high school students. So uh, again, a really great project to, be, to work with these kids. We probably worked with 75 to 100 kids in this project. And then uh, I'm gonna just kind of go through, this is our MLK project. You see the blank wall, I'm not gonna get too detailed in this either, just for the sake of time. Um, but you could kind of see process going through. We did a lot of collage work with these kids. You can see we had them do individual collages. You could see the photo of Ed in the upper right or lower right. You see those little storyboards on the bottom that the kids did and we just blew them up and made big, bigger sections and then laid them out in rows on the building. When we got to a certain point on this project, we sort of knew we needed something else. And we sat and we talked to some of the folks from um, uh, the MLK Center. They started, they talked to us about Harry Burley and the idea of spirituals being, um, uh, being something that, uh, is in common with the African-American population throughout the history of Erie, Harry Burley being, you know, a superstar. And we looked up some of Harry Burley's actual notes and we found, I think it's an unpublished piece that was let the children sing. So those were the notes, it fit our mural. We were able to put the staff on, make it colorful. And um, that's how that mural came together. And, this is my last slide before I show you just some of our more recent projects. This is how our team's evolving here. So we know Ed's on the West Coast, but he's still with us. Uh, my wife, Kathy, who has been an incredible painter, she has helped us with a lot of the murals. Um, Ron down there has been a part of a few of our projects and um, he's a part of one that we're working on now. My son, Dean, in the lower right-hand corner, Dean does all of our graphic design. He did the last video that you saw. Uh, he does, um, uh, when we put our ideas together, he photoshops them, uses Illustrator, all kinds of programs that um, Ed and I aren't that proficient on. And then in the upper right, we have Steve Mick. And Steve is uh, our newest member of the Looking Glass team. So Steve is working on another project with us right now. So this is sort of our team. But I also want to mention that we have worked with other artists in the community, Barbara Crone, um, Ashley Pastore, uh, uh, Deirdre Keen, uh, Caesar Westbrook. So we try to bring in the talents as we need them. Um, this is sort of a list of our other projects that we have done since uh, some of that video was done. Larry's Market, uh, this is the, um, uh, the market, the farmer's market in our little Italy uh, with uh, Sisters of St. Joseph's Neighborhood Network. We have, we did a work with the Eastside Grassroots Coalition. That was three groups that we worked, Ed and I bounced between three different locations to work with three different Populations. The one on the left we did with the JFK Center. 
upper right, House of Mercy. Uh, we worked with a lot of Bhutanese uh, children on that one uh, and, and some adults. And then the lower one was the UCEDC uh, headquarters. And um, that was done with a lot of the students that came into their after school program. So it's kind of a welcoming piece to welcome people to their home. Uh, a lot of, they had a, a lot of um, uh, kangas in the, in the building that were on loan from the museum that were, uh, you know, had, had, has a lot of different African prints on them that all have meanings to them. Projects at Strong Vincent Middle School that we've worked in the school. These, these two pieces are actually in the school. Uh, this is in Franklin. This was a project at the Barrow Theater in their Little Theater. Uh, this is the Erie Federal Credit Union. This is uh, a playground at the Church of the Covenant. Really great project there. You'll see there's some imagery in there that is done literally by two-year-olds. Uh, this is a project with Ben Franklin Technologies. This was fairly recent. This is an interactive piece. So as you walk down these stairs, uh, we worked with uh, the owners of um, Acoustic Sheep who did some, uh, created some uh, sound and lighting that as you walk through the piece, your body creates a vibe that creates a sound that creates the lights. Very cool piece. Um, this year, we installed a piece uh, that Ron and Ed and I worked on at uh, Pontiac Field to uh, pay tribute to the, uh, the Pontiacs who were uh, uh, kind of an offshoot of the professional Negro League team. A lot of players from the Negro League and this uh, were a part of this team. A lot of history for our West Bayfront in this particular piece. And then uh, we've done some work with uh, Strong Vincent with uh, projects that are ongoing now. We call them Art Force, and they are in the R West Bayfront neighborhood, creating a pathway to the entry point to the uh, bike and walking path that we are actually now starting to work on a, uh, an archway or some kind of a sculptural piece for the top of that trail head to identify the marker. And these pieces are kind of along the way on Cascade Street, pointing the way to that, to that spot. Um, Unitarian Church up on Route 97. And this one is out on 12th and Powell at Keystone Research on the face of their building. And I believe that is it. So I am going to stop here and back to you there and open it up if there's any questions from anybody on anything, process, products, materials. Tom, I'll start with a question for you. Go ahead, Patrick. What has been the benefit of the collaboration and partnership between you and Ed as two artists that um, certainly have overlapping, I think, values and visions, but differing um, disciplines and skill sets. Yeah, so um, we have we have we definitely have different sensibilities, and we we look at things uh, kind of you know with a different set of eyes. Um, Ed's background. Um, I can tell you, I could attest, he can paint. <laughs> As you know, in art school, you're gonna to learn to paint usually, uh, no matter what discipline you end up zeroing in at. Um, but but uh, Ed also has maybe a little more of a logical methodology to him. And he knows how things are put together. Uh, I don't know how things are put together that well in terms of construction. So, uh, you know, Ed is, um, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll throw ideas out and Ed will look at me like, well, how are we gonna do that? <laughs> and so having that interaction between us and typically what we would do is, we'll, you know, we, again, we go in with a blank sheet of paper and we look at what's presented to us. We come back into our studio and we'd say, we have, we have uh, chalkboards all around us. 
we start writing down words. We start finding things that were common and out of our participants. Those words create the ideas and we would try to marry our sensibilities to what our participants were telling us. It seems to have worked. So I guess that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's where our chemistry has worked. Um, it also, you know, I, I, I might add, because, you know, a few times Ron has been involved, uh, a few times other artists are involved. Um, Kathy, when she's painting, you know, she'll say, hey, I'm not so sure about this. And, you know, so we are wide open. Um, Dean, when we're doing a design, uh, Dean will sometimes run with some of what we're telling, us, telling him and we'll, you know, we'll leave it for a few days and come back and Dean will have like this whole thing put together. We're like, yeah, Dean, that's what we meant. You got it. So um, having more than one set of eyes, I think is a real advantage to what we do. And, you know, if you go back and you look at all the work, uh, while there is some similarity in style, it's not all similar. And I think that's one thing that we like about what we do is that um, every project's fairly unique and unique in materials, unique in installation, unique in concept um, and aesthetic. Well, I just want to add, I think it's a, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I think it's a true co collaboration. That's what, that's what, uh, that's what really uh, is important to, I think, Tom and myself is that uh, it's a give and take. It's a, it's an interaction that uh, uh, makes the piece uh, a little more than just something we do in our studio and then present to the world. Uh, we try to bring the world into the to making of the art piece. Yeah, and there are some pieces that we've done that we have not had the opportunity to get a lot of input but it's not without lack of trying. And, you know, at minimum, we'll throw them a set of questions and we'll have them, you know, at least start to drive some ideas based on their responses to questions. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's very important to us. Court? Tom and Ed, it's almost like one name now. I've heard it so many times, Tom and Ed. <laughs> First, thank you for what you've done and are doing for Erie. You have uh, really mastered working with different people in different media and your presence and impact is tangible in one's moving around Erie. I sense that you're in a moment of trying to figure out your future as a team. And toward the end of this conversation, you introduced us to perhaps your most important work of art. And that is developing those who are part of your team. And hey, Dean, uh, good job for teaching these two old guys everything they know. <laughs> Thank you. Let me, let me ask you sort of an existential question as I'm having a gut feeling that you two are searching for where you go next, both literally and figuratively. How do you know when you have accomplished what you want for Erie? Well, okay, I'll take the first stab at that. Um, I don't know that there's any end game here. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever accomplish totally what it is that, you know, that we, we I, I just I just feel that we're we're kind of a part of we're a part of a whole. We're one little component of it. So I find it really important that, and I think this is one of the things that I loved about public art and what, what kind of attracted me to it, is I find it really important that it integrates with everything that's going on in the community, uh, not just the art. Uh, I think it's important for uh, neighborhood development. I think it's, 
important for personal development, for young people, old people, that whole lifelong learning thing. And, you know, as I say, I, I don't see, I don't think there's an end to that. I think that it's just going to continue and hopefully it just gets better and, and more people get involved and see, and see the beauty of uh, collaboration. And, you know, when we say collaboration, we also push individual creativity, but then how does that individual, how does your individual statement fit into the whole? And to get people to see that's important. So, I mean, that's a little more bigger challenge. And, and I think you see it, I mean, you see it in community development plans. Our project with Art Force is all about, you know, the neighborhood plan of our West Bayfront. We engage those students to say, hey, what do you see as a problem in this neighborhood? We show them why a community plan is important, why you just don't, you know, put up a building here because you got a space to do it. Um, we want it. We want people to see a bigger picture, not not just what their own little world gives them. Yeah, and I think um, <laughs> what's important to me too is uh, the involvement, having the people actually in, involved in the art making and the and the. Uh, so it's not just something that two artists collaborate on and then plop down in a community and expect them to, to appreciate it. It's uh, when you have them involved in the process, then the appreciation comes from them. You know, the, uh, it's, it's much more fulfilling for me anyway. Can I, I want to say something to chime in here <laughs> because I, I'm still the promoter of art. <laughs> Can't get it out of my blood, but how I was listening in the background. I'm working on a project over on my computer and I heard what you've done. You know, the, the history of what you've done is phenomenal and how proud I am to be able to bring this to the West Coast in both places, in Seattle and in Santa Barbara. And I already know in Santa Barbara, they are very interested in what you're doing. And I'm so proud and so happy with, and grateful for the Erie Arts and Culture to support what you've done and create this history and create this model for us to emulate on the West Coast. So I wanna thank everybody involved. Thanks, yeah, we appreciate that. And then exactly. sitting on Ed's lap, we know why they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is Emmett. This is Emmett. Hey, Emmett. Hey, Emmett. <laughs> so I met some artists today, Tom. Okay. And, yeah, they got a nice little gallery here and a, and a community space. And they're making some pretty interesting things. So uh, we haven't really talked about collaboration yet, but I, I'm sure there's opportunities on, in both areas over here. I'm sure there will be. Yeah. Anyone else got any questions? Any comments? I'll ask another one while, while folks contemplate. What What do you, uh, each Tom and Ed, what's the project that you feel challenged you the most and what, what form did that challenge come in? Well, my answer would be Rouse the Rouse project and only because the, the population was really challenging uh, because of their, their limitations and not really knowing every time we drove down there, we really didn't know what we were gonna walk into. And, you know, it makes it, um, one, one of the things that I find for me that makes it easier for me. And I think it, that for some people it may not be easy, but um, I learned to paint by reacting to my pain. Uh, so I don't go into it with, okay, I'm gonna paint an apple to look like an apple. And I've always adapted to my work. So I sort of transfer that when I walk into a population and I see kind of what the dynamics are that, you know, you have to react to what, what's going on in a room. So to me, that was the most difficult one. Again, because we were bouncing between three groups and they were all so different. Oh, and, and the project was to try to put them all together. Yeah. Hey, I know. 
Anyone oh, else? <laughs> oh, you want to? You want to? I would have you to say, throw out I, that Actually, I would have to say the same. Really, um, Rouse was challenging in that. Um, that and the, um, I guess the, um, um, the one we did at uh, Erie High School also, because communication. There was a communication problem there at first, but then we worked that out. And then the, um, the, the uh, communities, um, I guess they're at, at Rouse, how, they, how we could involve them in the project, uh, especially with some of the issues that they had physically. Uh, it was a challenge, but we got through that too because we were able to reach a level of communication with them. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll also add that, you know, for some of these, you know, some of these populations and, and some of these projects, um, they, they, one of the difficulties is that time frame is trying to, you know, if you're, you know, let's say you're in a grant situation or you're in a residency situation, and, you only have so many days and you, have, you only have you know, so much budget. But some of these projects grow, they get legs once you start and you start to find out that, they're, um, uh, that there's, more, there's more information than what you thought might be on the surface. And, um, and I really feel that Ed and I have done a, a, a nice job of trying to move things and add to add add budget, add time as needed, and working with our, you know, with, with our sponsors, and with our whatever our community group is, uh, you know, I mentioned I mentioned the the uh, the one we did with with the, the Erie High School kids in the International Institute. It started at the International Institute. It went to Erie High. It actually had started with an idea for a window display, which Ed and I didn't really feel was in our, you know, that really wasn't, wasn't in our bandwidth. However, that, job, that project did happen and Kelly Armour did it and she did an incredible job with it. And, uh, you know, but we saw something different. So we were able to make that something different happen and the other projects still happen. And that's what we like to see. We like to see, we like to see you know that all grow. Hey, we got a new participant. Hey, hey, this is this is Opal. Hey, Opal. <laughs> Say hi. Say hi. hi. <laughs> are we recording this? We are. We are. Good. 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 It's going to be mandatory that the whole family watches it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions before we sign off here? Uh, can, can I ask a question if I can just call you in 20 minutes and ask it or, uh, <laughs> sure. do you, do you see, uh, any, any maybe untapped potential in Erie uh, uh, and, uh, a part of what's makes, what's unique about Erie that may, may be an opportunity for artists, artists on the speed, artists who might be looking at this later. Um, do you, what do you think, um, the next big thing for Yuri could be. Well, um, I, I might I might pass that off to Patrick in a second, but before I do that, I, I'm going to say that um, I think that there's a lot of things happening now, sort of simultaneously, simultaneously within the community. There's a lot more artists that are jumping in to do some projects. Um, I think that I think that Patrick has opened the door for other types of projects that aren't you know they they might be public art but they may not be something that's a permanent installation it may just be activating a space for you know a period of time it might be a performance it's bringing other artists together um, there's there's all kinds of opportunities for those kinds of things to happen in Erie. And by the way, Dean's in Pittsburgh, so he doesn't know everything that's happening here in Erie. And um, uh, so I do think that there's a lot going on. We, uh, 
you know, we may have hit a little bit of a wall with the virus. It's, it certainly has affected how Ed and I have worked sort of the last few projects and what, you know, some of the things we're working on right now. But um, uh, I think that it, it just, it just show, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for more tech driven pieces to happen. Um, I don't know. I just think I think there's a lot of opportunity yet. To yeah, we've been trying to we've been trying to uh, with this with the virus. Uh, we've been trying to figure out how to uh, involve uh, community in a collaborative event um, online. Um, I'm not sure that we've done that. This might be a step in that direction. Um, the thing is, I think we could conduct our interviews and our uh, questioning and maybe even some workshop kind of things happening on online. Uh, yeah, we, we actually, um, Steve and I have been involved in a mural in Union City that we just started. And um, the way we've been working that is we have We've met with we met with just a, a couple of stakeholders within um, at, in Union City, um, and then we came back and we developed a set of questions and we sent them to their secretary of the borough. She sent them out to about um, six or seven different organizations, schools, senior centers, community groups. We got over forty five responses back from them. Then we did a follow-up uh, with another question and that was a little more in depth. Uh, we actually asked them to write a story and we gave them from the first questionnaire, we had pulled some material out and we formatted a, a second questionnaire that we asked for them to write a short story. So we got, we got about 15 responses back on that one. So that's sort of how we're approaching that particular piece. So we haven't really met people face to face, but we have quite a bit of material to work from. Uh, so, and I think it's, uh, we're working on design now. We're gonna make our presentation, I think the end of next week. And hopefully we'll have something that is gonna reflect what they wanna see, not what Steve and I wanna see. Yeah, I think the challenge in the future here is going to be how to involve people in the actual art making. Yes. You know, actually painting and or any kind of sculpture we want to do, how are we going to involve them during this period? I think, you know, things keep opening up and closing down again. I, uh, they've been pretty good with the schools here in Washington State. They just closed them down again just today. They're uh, going to go back to homeschooling again. So I don't know. We're going to have to just struggle through this. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? If, if I could, if I could respond to Dean's question, yes, uh, yes. I'm, I'm going to actually paraphrase Court Gould a little bit in my response, where say it's not a question of if, but when Erie recognizes its true potential and and steps up to become the great mid-sized modern city it can be. You know, it's it's up to us as a community. It's up to us as a sector to determine how much work do we want to put in and when do we want to put it in to get to that tipping point. And I think that, you know, if you look at this year alone, you know, we have Esther Ortiz on this call who is a, is a pinata maker. She's working with a sculptor right now to learn about how she can translate what she does as a pinata artist into a public artist making sculpture. You know, we had Antonio Howard in the call earlier. We have Cesar Westbrook. We have Jennifer Peters in this call, all of whom are making new public art projects this year. Um, we have new American artists that are uh, working with folks such as Jennifer um, to, to figure out how they can translate their traditional or folk art form into something like public art. And I think the role of mentors is really, really important. And I think that Tom and Ed have been tremendous mentors. And I think you can see that ripple effect where, you know, last year, Jennifer was in a workshop with Tom and Ed learning about how to use the materials and how to work with Polytab and install it and design on it. 
Fast forward to this year and Jen is now passing that knowledge on to somebody else. And who does that person pass that knowledge on to? And I think that one of the remarkable things about Erie <coughs> is just how much our sector can and does crowdsource and information share with one, with one another. Um, I think that in our community, there's not this level of competitiveness that you sometimes see in other communities because you recognize if you poison the well, it's the very same well you're drinking from, right? So it doesn't do you any benefits. And I think that that, that willingness to share and collaborate and learn together and take risks together um, is, is really tremendous and fantastic. And I see it just occurring more and more rapidly uh, with, with honestly each, each passing month. I mean, if we look at the amount of new public art projects that were started and installed over the pandemic, it, it's really awesome. um, So I think, it, you know, to again go back to Court's quote, when we get to that tipping point. All right, that's good. So if yeah, I, I, I'd also just one more comment on that is that, you know, we, we tend to see things um, like, like day to day and, you know, it sort of lulls you to sleep. But when I put this presentation together and I went back to our origins, that really puts it in perspective to say, okay, let's look at a 10 year snapshot and see what's been accomplished. And it's not just Ed and I who have done a lot of work that 10 years ago wasn't in the community, but you have Aaron Knapp's work, you have Caesar's work, you have Antonio's work, you have so many, you have, you have the artists that have come in from you know, other parts of the world that have done work. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely something that I think has, people recognize its value. People recognize that this is something that that creates an identity, that makes a community vibrant, that tells a story, talks about not just where you've been, but where you're going. And I think that's, you know, I, you know, with our natural resources that we have here, and you, now you start to sprinkle in some, you know, redevelopment that's going on, public arts all a part of that. Um, we will be that world-class mid-sized city, uh, hopefully someday. Well, if there's no further questions, Tom and Ed, I want to thank you both for all of your contributions and work over the past 10 plus years, uh, both as public artists, but also as rostered teaching artists with Erie Arts and Culture. The work that you do, as I mentioned, does ripple through our community and lives on uh, with every life that, that you all have, have touched and impact. So, so thank you very much. Tom, I also want to thank you for putting this presentation together this evening and, and sharing it with us all. Uh, and for everybody who chose to spend their Thursday evening with us. As I mentioned, this is being broadcasted on Facebook. So if you're interested and you have Facebook, you're welcome to go back and uh, rewatch it or share it with others. Uh, it will also be posted on Erie Arts and Culture's blog as a living resource. Um, and with no uh, further questions, I, I thank you all and I wish you all a good evening. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick.